Um, so, I'm sure, or I'm hoping, that you're all bursting with questions. You should be, because that was an incredibly deep um, and confronting set of um, facts, scientific gatherings. Um, so, I've, I've got a few things I want to ask Mark myself, but I'm going to open the floor straight up to you guys um, first. I'll only ask mine if you are too quiet. Um, but there's a couple of rules. Um, the first one is that this is for questions. So. It's not a time for you to be putting a commentary or putting a, an alternative view or, or whatever else you might want to do. So please just ask your question um, of Mark. It's really a rare opportunity to get someone uh, like Mark available to answer, to, to answer the question. So let's do that. If you do start drifting into commentary, I just warn you now, and I'm not going to be rude about it, but I will cut you off and we'll get you to pass the microphone on to somebody else. So that's the first rule. The second rule is um, no doubt we have a whole range of different views in the room on climate change um, or on the climate science and I do ask that we just all respect one another's view as the questions are asked, allow the question to be asked and allow the answer to be given. Um, so that's the second rule. Um, and the third one's not really a rule, it's just a comment really for myself, which is that I'm really just facilitating um, if there are questions that are more directed to me. So, so most of the questions I guess I'm saying is please direct them to Mark. If there are some that are more in my space, I'll, I'll reserve the right to comment um, what you hear. Um, but really this is mostly about questions for Mark. Um, so, having laid the ground rules down, can I see a show of hands? We've got some mics. There's one over on the left on the stairs. Can I grab that first and then we'll, we'll go right up the back and then in the middle. And if you can just quickly say, if you if you will, I'm sorry, I'm the stairs right behind you. Um, just quickly say who you are and then cut to the chase with your question. Thank you. Uh, hi, thank you very much for the speech. Um, my name's Naomi, I'm one of the and Sorry for the beginning. Um, one of the questions I have actually speaks to your last point, which was um, I'm curious is there a appetite to change some of the language to indicate the urgency, basically by changing some of that 1.5 to 2 degrees, which is most people is linear, to more of a risk scale to um, actually communicate the, the increasing impact? Um, and whether there's also space, um, or if you see space for things like um, circular economy. Um, and the project for down assessment sounds a lot like a lot like to work in space. Yep. Um, th thanks for that question. It's a really good one. So, so one of the elements here is that this is actually the intergovernmental panel. So it's actually not owned by the scientists. It's actually owned by governments. Um, and so, to some extent, there's there's a, a, a certain limit in terms of the appetite for um, how we express things. Um, and so it tends to be expressed in fairly straight down the line uh, ways. Um, but I personally would encourage, and I'm pretty sure the IPCC would encourage others um, to take up the information of the IPCC and put it in um, other language, um, in, in other formats that make it accessible. So we can already see that happening on the web, um, even since uh, the report's been uh, uh, released uh, and where uh, people are taking that information and um, massaging it so that it's more accessible to the people that they're interested in. So, so I think um, they're good messages, but there are constraints uh, in terms of the, the nature of the process. And, and you might think that, um, oh, well, that's, that's a real nuisance, having the government sort of own this process and, and uh, uh, you know, in a sense, being very uh, consistent and concerned with their, their needs. Um, and you might think that's a, a problem, but in fact, I think it's a huge strength for the IPCC, because when this gets approved, um, it gets approved by all of the governments, there's a unanimous voting, um, and so all of those governments to a greater or lesser extent own the IPCC reports. And with that ownership comes some degree of commitment to um, taking notice of them. If this was done externally and we used whatever language we wanted to and presented in whatever language we wanted to, there is no ownership and there is no, in a sense, responsibility to take notice of what they say. So in all of these things, there's um, some pros and cons. Um, and at the moment, I actually think the IPCC is probably pretty much as good a model as we can actually find to taking the science and putting it into the hands of governments so that they can actually make sense of it in their own way. It was right up the back and then we might actually just do a couple in a row, um, collect them and then move on. So up the back and then in the middle. Yep. Thank you. My name is Terry Hall from the ANU. I, I've seen over the past half century a uh, rapid decline in human fertility. And that has brought some human populations down below uh, replacement levels. 
Some governments are now saying they want to increase fertility to bring up uh, the uh, populations in China, Russia, Germany, many countries. How did the uh, IPCC deal with human population growth in these models? Yeah. Uh, thanks, Joe, for that. Do you want to um, let me get oh, the other okay, question, if that's all right? So in the middle, thanks. Um, my name is Sue Nick. I'm um, a professor here. Speak closer to your mouth, Sue. Uh, sorry, my name is Sue Nick. Um, uh, honorary professor of research and biology. Um, I was, in order to get here tonight, I had to duck out of a very interesting interview that on, the, on this report that was happening on the drum. Uh, and it seemed that if I understood the comment correctly, um, one of the findings of the report has been that the cost of actually reducing CO2 emissions has actually declined dramatically compared to previous reports. And I wonder if you could elaborate on that, please. Mm. Two very different questions. So. While you're collecting your thoughts about it, are there more questions so I can get the mics or two? Okay, so the, the gentleman in the middle, I think the guy at the back's got that, and then we've got one at the front, right? So after this, thanks. Okay, yeah, no, so you, do you want to go ahead and answer those questions? Oh, I, oh sorry. Um, yeah, yeah sorry. Uh, so, so, Jerry, the, um, the, the simple answer is yes, they are, and they're starting to be explicitly recognised. Uh, for quite some time within the science community, uh, population has been a no-go zone, um, largely because it's been a no-go zone um, within the policy communities, and, uh, and so that's starting to change, and it's being ex dealt with explicitly. Um, clearly, if you have, and I'm saying if you have, a, uh, a set amount of emissions on average per person, if you increase your population, you're going to be increasing their emissions. It makes your emission reduction task harder. But at the same time, there's lots of national circumstances, particularly if you have age bulges moving through populations like we do in Australia, um, baby boomers, um, that then for other reasons may be a rationale for uh, increasing fertility rates or increasing uh, immigration rates. Um, and these are all part of the juggle that has to be made in terms of uh, you know, national policy settings. In terms of, um, Sue, so, uh, the cost, yes, um, each progressive IPCC report has seen massive changes in cost structures for renewables in particular, uh, and, uh, and of course that changes uh, the ability to bring those into the energy mix substantially. In fact, Frank Yotso from ANU just uh, a couple of weeks ago who was, uh, had a, a, you know, some media which said the, um, the cost of energy production, uh, levelised cost for renewables was actually now lower in many cases than the marginal cost of operating coal-fired power plants. So it's not the whole of the investment cost, just the operating cost, you know, putting the coal in, etc. And, and at that point, it makes operating those coal plants pretty marginal. And, uh, and so even without government policy intervention, if that continues, uh, we're likely just to see really big changeover simply because of that difference in costs. So it's a really big one and it will continue to change. OK, so we have the gentleman in the check shirt. Yeah. Yeah, uh, Tony Reed from uh, Fenner School. Um, I noticed uh, in the car question about carbon budgets, there's a remark in the summary for policymakers, which I've started to read, says there is a clear scientific basis for a total carbon budget consistent with limiting global warming to one and a half degrees. However, neither this total carbon budget nor the fraction of this budget taken up by past emissions was assessed in this report. Would you comment on that, please? Why not? Yeah. So, sorry, my collecting didn't really work before, so why don't you go ahead and answer it and we'll okay. keep going. Um, so, so the, the um, approach is essentially the same approach to the carbon budget as in the AR5. And uh, within the sixth assessment report, that will be revised significantly. Um, Mark, I'm Jenny Lowy from Climate Action Narrow. Um, coal, is, getting out of coal is the immediate problem that we've got in Australia at the moment with some hostile views from the federal government, as we all know. But I'm concerned about oil. Um, peak oil, um, the peak of oil was, was delayed by shale oil in America. But um, for those of us who were involved in that um, movement, the um, message was that um, uh, peak oil and, and shortages of oil would cause economic collapse. Now, if we are going to keep that percentage of oil in the ground as you've got up there, how are we going to avoid it? I guess in, in the past times, um, we, 
didn't have too many alternatives. So, so if you look at the um, past oil crises back in the 70s, um, uh, we didn't have too many alternatives to oil, and now we do for transport, for example. Um, we have got electric cars. There's a price point difference between buying a petrol car and an electric car, but we have the technology. And even range anxiety is starting to be dealt with. You know, we've got electric cars that do 600 k's. And, um, and so, so I think we do have alternatives. And similarly for oil for... You know, uh, you know, diesel to power generators to produce electricity. We now have good batteries um, systems, and we have uh, you know wind and, and solar which can produce that clean. Uh, so in a sense, we've given ourselves options that don't tie us into that particular um, uh, system. And so I don't think we need to look at collapse because we simply can just take on different options. You had uh, David Evans, my name. You had a rise at sea level of ten centimetres for. A 1.5 degree. At 1.5 degree, will Greenland, Greenland ice cap melt completely? And uh, what uh, temperature will it melt at? And that will presumably be uh, cumulative effects for a long, long time. Can you comment on that? Yeah. So at the moment, um, my, be- my understanding is that um, we're not looking at a complete breakdown of Greenland uh, at 1.5 or 2, um, but we are looking at that uh, once, once we get to higher temperatures. Uh, and of course, Greenland is important because there's about 7 metres of sea level rise stored up just on Greenland. So um, the, the challenge here, I guess, is that um, uh, as our science improves, um, our understanding of the breakdown rates of things like the ice sheets actually has improved significantly. And so uh, we're, we're seeing... Um, and, and at the same time, um, the changes in the real world, as in you know, what's happening to Greenland, are also accelerating. So our understanding is accelerating as, as is um, the real world changes. And, and so what we thought would happen perhaps 10 or 15 years ago um, is very, very different from what we're seeing happen now and what we might think would have happened you know, in, in terms of you know, this, just a few decades sort of thing. So I, I'd, I'd be really quite loath to be definitive about that because uh, our understanding is evolving so quickly um, as is the, you know, the breakdown of, and, and processes driving those breakdown rates of both Antarctic and Greenland ice sheets. Um, more broadly, if we, uh, there was a really interesting study just a few weeks ago um, which looked at paleoclimate analogues uh, for the current circumstances and looked at it's a sort of argument about tipping points, which I guess uh, I, I sort of think of as positive feedbacks. Uh, so where warming um, does something that generates greenhouse gases that produces more warming, so it just winds up the system. Um, and that particular paper said there's probably not a strong case for saying tipping points are going to happen between one, you know, up to 1.5 or 2 degrees, but once we go 2 degrees to 3 degrees, then they're going to start to cut in. Um, and so, so as long as we stay in that 1.5 to 2, we're probably not going to see the worst sort of scenarios that uh, uh, may otherwise occur. Okay, so there's a question over here, then there's one down the front, and then um, there's a lady down the front here. Hello, uh, Chandra Velazio from Plant Sciences. So, if I understand correctly, the business as usual scenario is four degrees increase. And I understood also that the two degrees increase is, is unlikely to occur in the drastic changes that are required to implement this scenario. What is the most likely scenario uh, given that the policies will be probably implemented? Too little and too late. What do you think the, the, the highest likelihood would be? Yeah. Well, thanks, Shanda. Um, the most likely scenario is the one we're going to adopt. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> s- scenarios are, are, are explorations of the future. You can't treat them in a probabilistic way. Um, uh, you don't get a central tendency around scenarios. Um, uh, they're whatever you choose to explore, so you actually learn something about the system. And so, so um, I, don't, I don't think we can talk about um, uh, you know, what's the most likely scenario, um, e- except if you sort of try to think about um, what the sort of global governance um, is, is trying to do, and that's like the Paris Agreement and the um, you know, negotiations later this year and, and, and ramping up the ratchet mechanism of the Paris Agreement. 
I, I guess um, my best estimate of that, and this is not a scientific assessment, it's not probabilistic, um, but I, I would say that we're not going to get anywhere close um, to the uh, emission trajectories um, globally um, that are going to keep us to two degrees. I, I think we're highly likely to um, go above that. Um, but I can always be surprised, and I would be very pleasantly surprised if uh, all of a sudden we actually um, push those tra trajectories down. Um, I, if we don't have these sorts of assessments, I think the likelihood of pushing down on those trajectories is much less. I think we need to have these sorts of discussions and this sort of information available to people um, so they can actually start to assess for themselves the consequences and then sort of essentially vote with their feet. Now, if you actually look at that, the Australian populace has already basically signed on to climate change. So between 66 and 75%, depending on survey, of Australians say they want more action on climate change. And they're not getting it at the moment, except in a few jurisdictions like ours. And, and so, so there's a big gap between what the science says and what the policy is doing um, at the moment. And I'm not being critical, Joe, but it's just a, you know, that's the conclusion from this report. Um, and there's also a big gap between what the Australian public says they want and what they're actually getting in terms of policy. And um, my guess as to how that's going to close um, is probably to only as good as anyone else's guess, but I think it does need to close. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Tony Slasher. I'm a water policy consultant. Uh, your message about um, SDG 6, the Clean Water SDG, and the conflict, if you like, between the achievement of that by 2030, as we're all committed to do, and the water interception that will arise from addressing climate change is a, is a, is a big, a wicked problem for us all. Mm -hmm. um, did the panel look at other potential ways of sequestering uh, carbon in the soil other than the uh, major scout reforestation which will absorb vast amounts of pressures for it. Um, thanks for that, Tony. The, the IPCC can only synthesise um, the literature is out there. So if there was a literature that covered that, then they can't synthesise that. Um, uh, the, again, the main part of that type of synthesis is going to happen elsewhere. So that will happen in the land report, um, which is going to be released roughly this time next year, or hopefully approved this time next year. And, uh, and that goes into much greater detail in terms of that. Um, and to some extent, you need to be going down to regional specificities um, in terms of soil carbon, because what happens in Finland is very different from what happens in Ethiopia. So I think there's another... Who's got the microphones at the moment? Just, yeah, so there's next. Thank you. Hi, my name's Jackie Russell. Um, I'm interested in hearing what you might say about what our Prime Minister's commented um, in relation to the report. And he said that... Um, the report doesn't contain recommendations or actions that Australia might take. What would you say about that? Um, I, I'd agree with half of that. <laughs> <laughs> So, so the report doesn't contain recommendations. Um, the report, as I said at the start, is it's not there to be policy prescriptive. We're not saying we recommend that governments um, do this or we think governments should do this. That's up to governments to actually make their decisions on. Um, in terms of actions, um, does it have actions that um, make sense to undertake? Well, I think it does. I mean, it covers a huge number of possible actions, different pathways, and what the trade-offs and synergies are associated with those. So, I half agree with the Prime Minister. <laughs> so, there's another question down the front, and then I've been conscious that my gaze has been caught by the front, so we'll go up the back next, um, and then we will come back. Don't worry, I know there's a couple of people at the front who've got more questions, which is great to see, but if you want to go ahead now, and then we'll do a bit of a loop at the back and then come back to the front. Hi, Mark. Um, my name is Alexander, and I work on a uh, poverty measurement tool called the Individual Deprivation Measure, which is founded in participatory research that will be able to experience people living in poverty. Um, I was hoping you could actually go back to the slide with the SDGs on it, and I'm just hoping to hear potentially a little bit about the methodology for how you drive at some of those indicators. I'm specifically interested in gender, but I'm interested in yeah. So, so the way this was done, again, uh, there was a compilation of the literature, uh, and thanks for the question too. Um, there's a, a compilation of the literature, and effectively there was an assessment 
um, sent a rating scale, which the um, authors of this chapter used uh, to assess those synergies. And so then they aggregated those up um, in terms of both the strength of the synergy, but also the degree of connectivity. So that's the little bit I didn't have time to talk about at the top, um, which is, uh, so there's two sort of measures here in each of these boxes. One is the, the length of each of these boxes shows the degree of connection. So some things are well connected with other with um, SDGs and climate action, um, and other things more weakly so. And so the, the length of that box indicates the strength of that connection. Um, and the colour coding here um, indicates the strength of the synergies or the um, trade-offs. And so whether that's a strong synergy or a strong trade-off or a weak one. So that's so so it was a um, a semi-quantitative um, assessment um, because they're dealing with incredibly disparate literature and so that's how they, the best that they could come up with to actually compile it to show these sorts of linkages. Do you want to follow? I, I just wanted to ask, are you surprised yourself by any of these in particular? Um, I, I, be I, I think in a sense, um, if there was a degree of surprise, you'd have to go back to the individual study and see what exactly they were talking about, what the context was in which they were uh, looking at that trade-off. So, um, you know, obviously there's a strong degree of context in terms of SDGs, and so so you'd have to go back and delve into the literature. And and this is recorded, so there's a essentially an appendix um, which is uh, huge, which actually um, lists all of these trade-offs, the ratings and the references that were used for each of these cells. So it's all there if you really want to delve. There's a question that might find in the middle, and then to the left, and then we're going to come back and do Ken and then, sorry, I don't know the name. So in the middle, please. I'm just wondering, we might be given, we might be facing an ongoing photo of democracy. And I'm wondering that if we are, is there a capacity for the IPCC report to include social science or psychology or political science? Look at successful strategies and potential strategies to address some of these issues. And if that's not the case, is there an option to partner with the CISRO organisation, the social science focus at the Institute of Ports, to come back with that? Is and how we might actually go about bringing that change in the world? Yeah. So, so again, thanks for that question. Um, so, so the IPCC probably originally started out very much as a biophysical science, um, but ever since the third assessment report has been inclusive of social scientists and, and, and last time around in the fifth assessment report we had ethicists and psychologists and uh, communi communication experts um, as part of the team uh, and the selection process uh, of the IPCC there's about nine different dimensions of selection for including any author um, in, in the IPCC and so um, and that's driven in part by sort of experience and disciplinary base and where there's a need for psychology or social science or ethics um, that's brought in and so so they're quite diverse um, writing teams within these chapters uh, you can always argue whether they're sufficiently diverse um, and I've had these arguments myself in the uh, selection process, but um, uh, but there are people like that in it. So, yeah, the microphone plays there. Uh, yes, Canada at CSRO. Uh, Mark, thanks so much for everything you do for IPCC and pushing yourself to give this, this wonderful talk so timely. Very much appreciate it. Okay, I want to throw a challenge at you on this issue of policy neutrality of IPCC statements. So every single model that has been used in this report that has been able to say that we can reach a steel 1.5 degrees have a, a, a global carbon market and put carbon pricing all across the, the, the economies. So do you think that as a research finding, not a policy prescription statement, such an important finding would not be a big highlight of the report and for this matter of the Summary for policy makers. Yeah. So, uh, so apologies, Pep, for, for not including it, but there is coverage of that both within the text of the chapters and also within the um, summary for policy makers. Uh, one of my criticisms of the report was it didn't deal with uh, sort of costs and benefits adequately in, in monetary terms and, and looking at some of those issues. Um, but that was really just because of the literature and the availability of literature on that to do it. So it's getting a little warm, so I think a few of you feel free to fan, even if you um, make a bit of noise.
So yes, it does deal with feedbacks, and uh, and to the extent that the literature um, was available for those at the time, so so the literature cutoff now goes back a, a fair way for this report now. Um, and since then, there have been additional studies, and, and the one I mentioned before, which was a, a really, uh, I think, a very thorough paleo study, um, which looked at uh, you know, previous analogues for tipping points, and that's where they came up and, uh, with the analysis that it's probably unlikely within 1.5 to 2 degrees that we're going to get significant tipping points. In terms of the carbon budgets, um, that's included, and so, so that... Um, a sort of those feedbacks, um, both positive and negative, you know, so they can cut both ways, uh, um, uh, are roughly worth 100 uh, gigatons of carbon dioxide. So, so if you're thinking about um, our carbon budget being, let's just say, 550 um, gigatons, um, the tipping point component, um, to add to that, which adds on uncertainty on the side, is roughly 100 gigatons. So, so the tipping points are much less um, in si size than than the human influence there. It's not saying they're not important, but they're less in size. Um, Jack Bessie from School Air, who um, came to install my question on tipping points. Um, but, so, um, in fact, I, I'm just going to ask a, a sort of variant of it, which is um, a fairly unfair question, because it's only three hours old, that the Guardian Environment Reporter um, has uh, got a story out saying the IPCC report underestimates the potential of tipping points to send the Earth into a spiral of runaway climate change. And they're quoting Bob Ward's Policy and Communications Director at the Brantford Institute, and Marion Molina, Nobel President Linda Brinner in '95 for his work on the ozone layer, um, comment like um, IPCC underestimates underestimate a key risk that self-reinforcing feedback loops could push our climate system into chaos before we have time to tame our energy system, etc. I suppose my question is, do you think that's fair comment? <laughs> I, I, haven't, I haven't read that. Um, <laughs> I've just been really busy over the last few days. Sure. Um, so, so the uh, my, my gut feel, without having assessed that that particular article and and the re reference is behind that, is, is I think that's an overstatement. Um, uh, I think um, uh, tipping points are very clear in hindsight. Um, they're very very difficult to predict and. Um, and there's lots and lots of uncertainties about about the um, the typical ones that we talk about. So you know, to do with methane and permafrost and things like that. And so, uh, I, I would actually go back because I don't think we have the process-based um, knowledge to actually do that at anything like a global scale to actually do tipping points thoroughly. Um, and nor do I think we have the knowledge to understand how the systems themselves, human and other systems, will respond to that because, generally speaking, systems respond in ways that cancel out um, perturb perturbations. That's Le Chatelier's principle in chemistry that you might have learnt in high school. And, um, and, and it's true in so many different systems. So if you're in dealing with an economic system, oftentimes if you actually get, say, a change in price, then the, the, the system will operate to pull that back into the, the fold or the, everyone else will move. It's the same in, in, in a physical systems, biological systems. Um, tipping points tend to cancel each other out. So there's a very dampened system uh, in many cases. Uh, so I, I would go back to that study that I mentioned before, which came out a few weeks ago, which looked at the paleo analogues uh, for tipping points. Um, and found that there was not good um, uh, evidence to say that those tipping points would be substantial um, within um, that sort of 1.52 degree sort of frame, but they could become more substantial if we go higher than that. So I've got two more questions, people with um, the microphones down the front, and then I think we've got time for two more after that. So can I see the most enthusiastic? <laughs> <laughs> one down the front and one in the middle, OK? Thanks very much. So, uh, sorry, it's Catherine and then the gentleman on the end and then those two. I can find it, yeah. Yeah. Um, it's Barbara. Uh, Barbara Norman, yeah, Chair of the ICT Climate Change Council, Professor of the McLean University 
Um, Mark, you finished quite strongly, um, and it was a brief presentation and an excellent presentation, thank you, um, on uh, just mentioning sustainable cities and the implications for our cities. Um, do you see the IPCC uh, doing further work in this field? Um, so, you know, the really important cumulative impact of our urban future and our growing cities uh, together with a uh, warming uh, planet, whether that's 1.5, 2, 3, 4 degrees, because uh, some of those scenarios are pretty frightening. Yeah. Look, uh, thanks, Barbara. Um, um, so absolutely. So um, in this uh, our sixth, the sixth assessment cycle, we've got um, our cities much more prominent than they have been before. So they they um, sit um, within the chapter structures and within uh, the scoping studies of the special reports where appropriate. And uh, in addition to that, um, IPCC, as you know, has already just run um, a climate change in cities conference, the one in Canada. Uh, and in the next cycle, there's an expectation that there'll be a special report on cities and, and urban systems. And uh, and it would have got in this round, except that there were three other special reports queued up in front of it. And if we'd done an extra special report, it would have broken the system. Uh, it would just <laughs> wouldn't have been able to cope. I mean, the system's already seriously stretched as it is. Um, and so, uh, so you have to wait um, for that special report for the next cycle, so um, another sort of seven years. Um, yeah. but, uh, but hopefully... Um, Imagine all the research you're going to do exactly. now and to contribute. That's, that's exactly what I was going to say. This is an opportunity, Barbara, to really, really do those publications. I'll be there. All right, so the gentleman has been waiting very patiently. Thank you very much. Or no, but... Keep the point very short and get to the question. According to, uh, according to the Berkeley Institute and other ones, we are already on the continent at 1.5 degrees above the industrial. And according to uh, uh, James Hansen, there is another half a degree uh, due to the masking effect of aerosols. So if that's the case, then we have two degrees plus on the continent. And the question is do you think that? Uh, the uh, global warming temperature can be set in particular value, given the amplified feedbacks which we're looking at. We have methane bubbling up in the Arctic, we have ice melting, there are fires, and there are the warming oceans. Can we talk about any particular number at all without taking the amplified feedbacks into account? Uh, thanks, Andrew. Is, is the, um the very fact that we have 2.0 and 1.5 demonstrates that this is not about precision of science. This was, those targets um, are essentially a function of the political process. I mean, why wasn't it 2.1736? Okay? So, so it's not about precision. This is about heading in approximately the right direction because that's all we can do at the moment. And so, so we don't want to, I don't think we want to get caught up in... Uh, arguments about precision um, at the cost of the big picture, because I think it's the big picture which is the important one. Mark, it's Sarah Pearson, I'm from a phase of trade. Um, thank you for reducing 20 metres to 20 centimetres in such a fantastic way. It was, makes it really uh, easy to understand. Thank you. I was wondering about the scenarios, and we did a real exponential overthink, and everything's happening exponentially including for geopolitical factors. So the geopolitics, the influence, the power, the views of globalisation, whether we're going to collaborate or lock down, this, that, the other, they're changing very rapidly. And you start to talk about scenarios you're talking about, that there could be massive unrest, global unrest. You know, there'll be people with um, even more poverty than we're seeing who will want to move around the world more. So that's the, the pessimist side of me, wondering whether that's taken into account, if you think, it's been taken into account enough, because I think that's going to be changing exponentially. Then on the optimistic side, could you give a comment about um, technology? So technology is changing exponentially. And, uh, I seem to have done a report with you many years ago where we were looking at energy change on it being, um, and climate change being based on energy efficiency. And if you look at Internet of Things, which was cars, yeah, those are the sort of technologies that are really changing rapidly. So I'm just wondering how that was taken into account and if that's a positive note um, for us. Oh, that's uh, very good. Thank you, Sarah. Um, 
So, so I, I guess the, the, the point, the first point that you made is um, essentially about just transitions. Um, so it's, it's not about um, just going for this um, at any cost, because that's not the issue. It's about um, how do you assess uh, the costs and benefits of action on climate change versus the alternative. And if there are going to be um, you know, potential for rights and things, if, if we go wholesale and change um, energy systems, if we don't do it well, um, there could equally well be um, wholesale rights if people are starving because of climate change. And so it's about ju you know, juggling those different factors then, and there's unknowns in relation to both of them. And so, um, so, so we do have to think very carefully about these transitions. It's, it's not um, a done deal and that's why it's really important for um, organisations like IPCC um, not to say this is the way to do things but just to say here are the options that you may want to think about when you're starting to um, take action, if you decide to take action. And that's where, where the IPCC has a role, um, and, and that's different from the policy role and the political role. And I think we need to s stay with that. Um, as soon as we transgress, um, our value um, actually decreases to governments. So, so that's one of the first things. Um, in terms of tech, of course, the tech is really important, you know, having cheap solar panels, having electric cars and all the rest of it. Um, but by itself, it's actually not the issue. Um, so, it's, you know, my old mantra is it's not about the technology, it's about how you use it. And, and so the big issues about self-drive cars, for example, are not about the technology, it's about all of the social issues and the insurance issues and the registration issues and all that type of stuff. So, so the tech is only one small part of the picture, but it's often a, a, an enabling <coughs> Um, element, um, which you know, if you don't have it, you can't do other things. Um, but you don't want to overly focus on it. So it's that balance between those things which is important. And our last question, please. Uh, my name is Joe Quates. Thanks, Mark. The, uh, uh, wondered if you could make a couple of extra comments about negative emissions, which um, in several of the pathways that the report is outlined is going to be extremely important. I read recently that deforestation is really still the only thing we've got. I've heard Tim Flannery talking about kelp forests and things like that. Do you have a sort of a short list of the most prospective um, emission pathways that we might have to find? Uh, yeah, there, there are around. Um, it wasn't particularly focused on in this report, but in the special report for land, um, there are um, significant uh, analyses, and in the oceans and cryosphere, I assume they're going to do some of the um, marine sort of ecosystem equivalents, the blue carbon, as we call it. Um, and so, uh, so there's, a, there's a whole range of different options, which include um, uh, you know, afforestation, reforestation, uh, you know, improvements in soil carbon under um, uh, agriculture, which is easier to say than it is to do. Um, uh, there's also carbon capture and storage, which is not really negative emissions, but it's, a, it's at least it's a way of taking some of the gases out. Uh, BEX can be negative emissions if it ever comes true sort of thing. Uh, and then there's uh, also a whole burgeoning field which is called carbon usage, which is storing carbon in products. Um, and so, again, um, that's very new and, and, and uh, um, still being developed. And none of these, in my view, are going to be... Um, they're not single bullet options. It's about a portfolio of these different options um, which hopefully will add up to something significant um, together rather than focusing on any individual one of them because the solutions for Singapore are going to be very different from the solutions for Australia. Thank you all very much for such a great set of questions. Um, I just have two things to finish up on. One is um, an administrative but a very important contribution from you as well. You will receive by email in the next day an evaluation form which gives you your chance to say what you liked about today and what the ANU Climate Change Institute could do differently to make these kinds of sessions even more informative for you in the future. So please fill that out when it arrives in your inbox. Um, the second thing is really to just say thank you to Mark. What an amazing presentation, as um, I think Sarah said, condensing an extraordinarily large amount of information into a really com comprehensible um, and clear presentation uh, and being willing to answer so many questions um, so patiently as well is really fantastic. So please join me with a big round of applause.
quick wrap up is that when you actually do these evaluations, um, we uh, synthesise those and we put, make them available on the web. So they're actually available for you to see um, so they don't just disappear. Um, and so, so we have now a list of these. Um, so, so please do it. It helps us become better at these events, um, but it also um, adds a traceability uh, element to these, uh, the effectiveness of these events. Um, and the last thing I just want to say is just um, coming back to these, this sort of uh, a quote from Beck, um, just reiterating, each half a degree matters, each year matters, and each choice matters. I think that's a great way to finish. It is. Thank you.